So yeah, Patrick Bet David and Value Tainment, they put out this shirt, Future Looks Bright. And when I first heard, I'm like, what is this guy talking about? Future looks bright. And this is like in the middle of the middle of the political campaign. And and my marketing like side of my brain was like, that's too many syllables for a slogan that's never gonna catch on. But my Catholic side is like, yeah, of course the future looks bright. And we're back. And we're back. And we're back. Back again. So you got the head on. It's cold in here, dude. It is very cold. I almost kept my jacket on. Yeah. Winter's here. We should do some calisthenics before we start. Is that warming up in here? But we do have some new- That's for the Patreon subscribers. Some... <laughs> You're stupid. But we got some new backlights, so we're, we're in the Advent theme. Oh, that's right. I didn't even notice that. It's purple in here. First Sunday of Advent. Yeah. So why purple? You're just going to jump right into it. We're not yeah. going to do our little thing. Well, I'm just wondering. How are you doing, Bobby? I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing good. How was uh, how was last night? How, we had a men's night last night with um, like, I don't know, how many guys? Was there probably 25 guys? It had to be at least 20 something. Who's at least 20? At least 20. So we had a men's night where we came together and yeah. had a chili cook off and had a guy's night. So I don't know. I, had a, I thought it was excellent. I had a great time and... It's nice to see guys coming together for something other than sports. And we come together, and in our small group, a lot of people were vulnerable in my group. Yeah. So it's good to see other men who are secure enough to be able to share things that are vulnerable, you know, because it helps other people be vulnerable, and and, and the vulnerability leads to growth. So it was it was awesome. I had a great yeah, night. what I appreciate in those gatherings is it's just real guys just coming together. It's not, you're, you're right. It's not like a Super Bowl party. It's not Sunday, you know, just hanging out, drinking beers and watching a game. We're coming together. We're enjoying each other's company and it's not weird. Yeah. So it was great just being. Cause it can be weird. It could be weird sometimes. <laughs> yes. Let's be honest. Yes. Or it could be like, I'm here and I'm the youngest. If you're talking about church stuff. It's usually a bunch of older guys. Yeah, I'm here. I'm the youngest guy in the room and I can't relate to anybody. And it was all a group of people our age, basically. So yeah. from basically like 30 to 50 somewhere in there that was like the range but it wasn't you know retirees it was no. people who are fathers and husbands and brothers and people who are professionals and all different swaths of life which is it's crazy to see like all the different careers that people came in representing and their perspective and everybody has something to contribute and if you're willing to listen you can really learn especially from people who you know maybe at the edge of you know their kids are teens and my kids are just becoming teens you can learn from from their life experience if you're willing to to be open and listen yeah you contribute but then you, as you talk to guys everybody's coming looking to receive as well. Like it, it's almost like this unspoken thing which adds to the the, the real uh, genuineness of the experience. Like, yeah, we're here to contribute our perspective to edify and to like help inspire our brothers. But we're all, we're all also looking to receive because we're all looking to grow in our faith, but in just like in a normal way. Like yeah. We got together, we had a chili cook-off. I was surprised at how many guys made chili. We had 10 chilies. It was insane. I couldn't get through them all. Yeah, it was 10 chili, and I have a ton left over. I'm like, guess what's for dinner, family? For the next two <laughs> days, lunch and dinner, let me get ready. Uh, but there was some, a lot of just like all these different guys that came, but they all brought a different chili. Like not one chili was alike. Mm -hmm. That's what that's just what, what everyone brings to the faith questions too. Everyone's bringing something totally different. Like you may have this recipe for chili, but this person, I mean, it was so different from one made it with, you know, chuck roast. And one was like a, a, a like a Mexicali. One was like a white chicken. Mm -hmm. One was like more beans. One was really spicy. It's like we had a, a, a you know, a plethora of different kinds. And everyone who comes to these things, it's like they bring certain different, like their flavor or their experiences yeah. or what they have to offer. So it was nice. It was a, a night based on gratitude. And when this comes out, this will be the day after Thanksgiving. But I was meditating a lot on how easy it is to get away from gratitude. You know, it's like that cliche and attitude of gratitude, but you literally have to cultivate it. Yeah. And then if you don't continue to cultivate it, that it easily goes away in the company that you keep like if you're around a lot of people that complain a lot, like you start complaining and it's really infectious. The people that we surround ourselves with, it's more contagious than a disease, their personalities and how they are. But if you're around other people who are grateful or who are striving to be better, it's that also rubs off. Yeah, maybe let's well. do that for a little bit. Riff on gratitude. Cause it was, it was a great topic for last yeah. night. Um, 
And you're right. I'm thinking back to like the the T-Mobile. You remember T-Mobile came out with like what was that? That my five or what was? What do they call it? Oh, with you can call the people. Yeah, like unlimited calls. Like who are your five? And it was yeah. like a big deal. Who was like in your five? And, but that's true. Like they say, you're the sum of the the five closest people that are yeah. that you interact with. And so, whose company do you keep? Like yeah. who do you allow in? Especially as you get older, when it's like harder to make time. I'm trying to schedule something with my buddy, and it's like we're going back and forth for a couple weeks now because he's got work, he's got a family, he's got all his responsibilities. I've got my my schedule and family and work, and it's like just connecting is difficult. So those people that you do allow into your life that rub off on you and you rub off on them, who are they? What kind of character do they have? Yeah. And are they the kind of people that you want to aspire to be? Yeah, is not it that edifying? You know, yeah, not that they're better than you, but like do they have traits that yeah. you can look up to? And likewise, what do you bring into the table? Yeah, at least not tearing you down or making it worse because, you know, those the monkeys in a barrel are trying to pull you down or, you know, that's, for me, that was the hard part as a convert of coming into the faith. It's mm -hmm. like you have this experience, you have this encounter with Jesus and you want to become this disciple, but you still are not mature enough yet to have those kinds of friends and you still have yeah. your old friends. So it's you're like, funny in that that desert, tension it's, like oh, it's a tension of for like, sure. well, these are my friends, yeah. but they're not the kind of friends that you would want yeah. to associate with as you're growing, yeah. not just in the faith, but as a person, right? Because faith yeah. is an aspect of who we are yeah. that hopefully takes over who we are, right? It becomes a fuller version of ourselves. But it's like that tension of who I want to associate with. And sometimes- Because you want to bring them with you. You want them to go, to, to, to be on the journey with like you, but it, some it, you're, not you strong enough, say, you're not strong enough yet to pull them with. No. <laughs> sometimes yeah. you just have to like cut people off and that's difficult. Yeah. And I've had to do that. I'm sure you've had to do and, that. And then you get the, you, what, you think you're better than us kind of talk. You know, I've got that. Yeah. No, oh, you go to church and you think you're something special. I'm like, no, I've just come to the realization that I can't do it on my own. I'm a sinner, that I need a savior and it's nothing personal. And I keep, can't keep doing what you're doing. Like yeah. I just. And that's, and, and, and that's part of growth. And that's part of, you know, like you only get X amount of time. So who are we spending that time with? It's like, I can't be there. Like once in a while, I'll still see some of my friends who I used to, you know, do stupid stuff with. Yeah. And I don't, you know, go down to, to it's that level. Though, yeah. it's, it's different because I've matured a lot. But when you're first yeah. going through that growth, it's very hard. And I'm just reminded of the, the story, how important friends are, that story in the gospels when that a guy was saved because of his friends, that they believed so much that they were willing to crash through the roof to lower them down just to get them close to Jesus to heal them. That was through the faith of their friends that they believed so much that they were willing to crash a roof to get close to Jesus. So like, are those the kind of people that I'm surrounding myself with? Their faith is that strong that they're willing to help me if I'm doing something I shouldn't to pick me up and say, hey, let's, let's not do that. Or hey, instead of doing going out to the bar this night, like, hey, how about we go to adoration or do this Bible study? Am I surrounding myself with people like that? And that's this group that we're trying to help cultivate and, yeah. and, and lead. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's inspiring because it's like everybody's on this journey, but we're, if you're surrounded with people who are trying to aim towards God and trying to be the best version of yourself, that it's just, it helps to have people running, you know, with you versus holding you back and pulling you back. You know, everyone's encouraging each other to, to, to grow. And that takes, you know, humility and it takes that, that it, that skill really to cultivate and the the wherewithal to like know like maybe this relationship isn't the best for me and you know trying to find people who are it's hard especially and you know depending on where you're at in your parish you know if you have like people our age who are trying to run after God there's not a lot of people that isn't there that isn't how they you know usually experience church because it's not a lot of people it's usually a lot of women, a lot of retired people who are doing like Bible studies and doing those things. It's not a whole lot of people who are dads and younger guys who are trying to do it. So it's nice that we're blessed in our parish to have, you know, people from the, especially from the school and from the parish where we can try to grow together and to help each other, lift each other up. Yeah. And we can't overemphasize or stress the importance of being surrounded by those people because salvation is a team sport, right? God's the GM, the coach, and the quarterback. And it's like, who else is on the team with me? Who's on the field with me? Yeah. And we have a say on who we let on the field, who we're going to try to run this race with. And uh, it comes to mind, and we don't have to say names. Um, he knows who he is, but one of the guys, and this is why I want to bring it up, because I found it so inspiring. When men can be vulnerable, not in like a, so I'll just I'll qualify by saying like, there's nothing wrong with crying. 
Yeah. Right? I mean, I'll see a, a commercial that hit me, hits me the wrong way and I'm just bawling. Oh, nice. Nothing wrong with emotions. Nothing wrong with crying. It's not nothing about that. But it's different when men can be vulnerable around other men. There's like, it takes a certain level of courage, bravery, and security to be able to do that. And so one of the guys, we're having this great, you know, conversation after, you know, um, the reflection that we heard. And he shared, and I shared this with you before the show. He shared, as we're talking about gratitude and, you know, different guys are sharing ways that they've cultivated gratitude or how they practice gratitude or how they see, you know, the life through this lens of being grateful, having that attitude of gratitude. And then one of the guys who was quiet for most of the, the discussion, you know, towards the end, he goes, you know, guys, I hear what you're saying and I really appreciate it. It's thought provoking, but I don't have it. I'd like to have it, but I don't have it. I don't have that attitude of gratitude. And so, but to be able to like admit that, um, like a lot of respect, props to him for saying that. Because it, it, again, it not only takes courage, but it takes the ability of saying like, you know, I don't have it all figured out, but I want to figure it out. And so I'm going to go to something like this group. I'm going to participate in things. And he went on to say like, I, I never saw myself joining a group like this. I never saw myself hanging out and just, you know, we're, we're going to enjoy each other's company. We're going to crack open a few beers. We're going to have chili. We're going to, but then there's going to be a talk and then we're going to have some discussion afterwards and we're going to be willing to open up and be real with each other. It's not something that he saw himself ever doing. So for him to recognize, I don't have it all together, which none of us do, but I'm going to do something about it. And even though he's not there yet, I mean, so much respect. Yeah. Like that's what you want to see. And that's, I think God delights in that. Yeah. He delights in seeing his sons taking themselves seriously and taking that call within our hearts seriously. Well, we, we know that vulnerability leads to intimacy because we're showing our heart. We're like exposing ourselves. That's why we're, it's vulnerable. That's why, you know, when you expose yourself, like you can die, like, like with somebody, if your neck's open, like in an animal, they're always crutched down. So their neck's not open. And if we open up ourselves to let our hearts open, we can be hurt. And that's what we're worried about. We're worried about being rejected, that someone may laugh or not understand. So we're scared to do that. So if we can cultivate an environment where you feel that trust and you feel the safety of, hey, I can expose what my true heart is. And it's practice for how we are to be with God. Because if we don't open ourselves up to God and we don't let him know, like he knows everything, of course, but our hearts are the one place where God doesn't have control of. We have to let him in. And, you know, that's the door is open from our end. So we have to open it up. So if we are vulnerable enough to share with other people, it's a good practice to God, like, God, I'm not there yet. Or, hey, you know, I don't understand this thing, but, you know, I want to learn more. Uh, you know, me and Katie always kind of, we disagree on this uh, this point, kind of what that what that guy was expressing, that he doesn't feel it yet. So we, we were kind of disagreeing about, like, fake it till you make it kind of an idea is that my opinion would be that is that act as if sometimes not that I'm being phony but like when you put it out there and even just practice like I'm grateful like I don't feel it but I keep saying it or I put myself in those positions that eventually sometimes the, the feeling comes second it doesn't come first like I don't feel I'm grateful but I'm just going to say it. I'm going to keep practicing it until maybe it does yeah. seep down to, you know, that it's not me being fake, but it's like you sometimes like, like this today, I didn't feel like going to the gym. I didn't jump up. Like, I really want to go work out today. Like a lot of times I do, but there's sometimes I woke up, I woke up with a little headache. I had an extra two shots or whatever last night. So I was like, I just want to chill. I had a day off, but I didn't feel like going to the gym. But once I went to the gym and I got a couple sets in, then I started feeling, okay. And then you start to feel it a little bit. So here's where I, so what was Katie's perspective? She's like, no, that's just phony. And I can't remember exactly because Monsignor Shea, he shared something. I actually screenshot it. And I Katie, I'm sure you were more eloquent in your yeah, response. Yeah, well, we were talking in, uh, <laughs> we had a, an interview with a guest and she was talking about being authentic. So not like faking it. Like not like, I guess my, what, what I was trying to say is, is that our unconscious is a lot more powerful than we understand. So much of what we do you know, like 90% of what we do is unconscious. So yeah. like what we tell our unconscious, our, it, it doesn't filter out if it's true or not true. Like what we tell it, it'll do. And it's weird how it works. So it's like our unconsciousness, if we just say, I am grateful, thank you. If we just practice, even though I don't feel it, well, if I'm here, just saying here's it. Here's where, because I, I, I see where she's coming from for sure. Yeah. And I see where you're coming from, how I'm hearing that and how I would kind of respond. It's not necessarily like a fake it till you make it. 
it's if you don't have it, you exercise the discipline. Yeah. And in exercising the discipline, in doing the thing that needs to be done, you start acquiring the muscle, right? Yeah. And so if I'm dis so gratitude, like I'll make it practical. If you don't have that spirit of gratitude, but you want it, you don't want to go through life like resenting things and always stressed and, you know, my, my work sucks, my boss sucks, I go home, my wife isn't grateful for what I do, my kids are all over me, like you're just, if that's your attitude. Well, the, the converse of that is to, to have this grateful attitude. So how do you acquire that? You lean into the discipline of generosity. The more you give of yourself, yeah. the more you receive. And so the more I'm generous with my gifts and my talents, the more appreciation I'm able to experience, not just the appreciation of the thank you from the other who's received my service, but when we truly give of ourselves, like we, I'll give you an example, this, this Thanksgiving, we're going around, our parish is feeding 1,300 people, right? We're delivering meals all over Northwest Indiana. <clears throat> when you go and you're able to extend that service to others, to give drink to people in Jesus' name, it, you begin to count your blessings in a new way. You begin to see life in a new way. You're able to step outside of your bubble, that silo that we tend to live in, because a lot of times we live with blinders on unintentionally, but we're just so focused on ourselves. We're so inwardly gazing. We're navel gazing all the time. And so what generosity does, it gets me looking outwards. It gets me looking at the other person. And so if I could lean into that discipline, and if I'm seeking to acquire gratitude, well, what God calls me to do is be generous. Uh, one of the questions that we discussed yesterday that I, I really appreciated, it's like Jesus talks about love God and love your neighbor. And is he actually talking about gratitude there? And so I don't think he's actually, he's not primarily talking about gratitude. He wants us to love. And so what is love? Love is the complete abandonment of yourself for the good of the other, the complete yeah. willing of the good for the other, for his sake, like nothing for me. I want everything for you. I want what's good for you. And so we're meant to have that for God. We're meant to love God unconditionally above all things. And so if I don't feel like I can do that yet, how can I begin to acquire that? A, it's a work of grace. So like the spirit has to move within you. Yeah. When that happens, you begin to realize how much you're loved, how much God has poured himself out for you, how generous he's been with you. And once you receive that, again, it's a movement of grace. Once you begin to realize how much God's given you, you begin to feel that love of the Father, right? You begin to feel that love of sonship or daughtership. When you realize that Jesus died on the cross for you, we're going to talk about Advent later in the show. When you realize that he came and will come again for you, then it's like, I can't but respond with love, right? When you've had this genuine encounter. And in responding with love, in receiving the Father's love, in responding to him with love, then I can, I'm equipped to turn to my neighbor and to love them, not out of my own kind of reserve, but God fills us so that we can love other people, so we can pour out ourselves to other people. So this idea of like, if you're trying to grow in a virtue, which these are virtues, these are like things to aspire to. That's what a virtue is. It's a good that we can aspire to. Lean into discipline in pursuit of that virtue. And so if the virtue here is gratitude, I want to be grateful, lean into the discipline of being more generous. Try to do one thing for one person every day. And you've given us examples before, like, who are you praying for? Like, offer your day for one person. Pray for that one person. Maybe just like make it a point to call one person, to make time to say like, no, I'm going to stop. I'm going to call. I'm just going to check in on somebody. That's a great way to be generous. Something like Thanksgiving rolls around. We need people driving meals all over the, the this area. Yeah, I'm going to take a couple hours out of my Thanksgiving because I'm grateful for what I've received and I'm going to give back. I'm going to take my family and we're going to go deliver meals. You can f find small ways to be generous and in leaning into that discipline, you begin to receive the virtue. Yeah, I guess the fake it is is the the word that. Oh yeah, know, sure, it, colloquially, but, yeah. But, but it's it's like I don't have it yet, but I'm just gonna do these things, and I may not feel it right away. Yeah, your gym analogy is great. Like yeah. Goggins talks about this all yeah. the time. If you wait, if you only wait till when you feel like it, you're never, you're never gonna, gonna want to do like it. it. You never want to do it. So like you get up yeah. and you do it, and you <laughs> and do then the you thing. start to do it. Yeah. And the story now, I remember the story Monsignor Shea shared. I don't know if it was a movie or it was a story, something in France, but it was a guy who was cheating on his wife. 
and he was about to leave his wife for his mistress. And he went to go talk to his wife. He was going to tell her, I'm leaving you. And before, and she said, well, no, I have something to tell you before he told her. And he said, uh, she said, I'm dying of cancer. So he's like, oh, man. So he's like, all right. Well, he immediately broke it off with the mistress and he ended up taking care of his wife. He was out of love with her. He's falling out of love with her. He's loving some other woman. And the whole existential thing changed that she had cancer and that he stopped and just went to serve his wife. And in the process of doing that, he grew, fell in love with her yeah. again by giving himself up. And it was a good example of that. It's like the fake it is and I, we should still always be That's integrated why, and be authentic. I, yeah, so uh, we, we didn't plan on talking about this, but like marriages, you see marriages falling apart now when they didn't at the rate that they do not, uh, previously. And there's a lot of reasons you can point to. Like, there's a lot of you, men and women have financial independence, you know, control of their 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 sexual prerogatives. Um, there's this autonomy that we each want to claim for ourselves. All, all this stuff that you can say that are modern pornography. I mean, all kinds of things. Well, there's all kinds of create wedges. Yeah, the separation isn't what it what it it is now. What it never has been before. Um, but I think one of the primary reasons, if you get at the root of it, is like how many people enter a marriage seeking to get out of it more than they're willing to put into it, yeah. right? How many times do you hear like, guys, my wife doesn't love me the way that I want to be loved or she doesn't give me the attention that I want or – and so they go start seeking it elsewhere because it's about like what I want. And so if you flip it on its head, how much do you pour into your wife? How much time do you make for her? Does she come first before the job? who, let's face it, your your corporation that you work for is going to replace you in a second once you step out. They don't care about you, yeah. right? And that could be the you, – heck, I, you work for the church. Like the church is going to fill the spot once I'm gone. And so I love what I do here, but it's like, no, my number one priority should be my wife and should be my kids. And, and there are seasons, like sometimes I'm really busy. I don't give them as much time as I need. But then sometimes I'm able to do that. So it's like – my general attitude is like, do I pour into my wife? Do I love her for her sake? Do I will heaven for her? Do I know that like the only thing I'm taking out of this life, it's not the cars, the houses, whatever I can acquire. The only thing I'm taking with me is my wife and my kids and all the people that I've been able to bring to Christ. Like that's literally the only thing we can take for us. And how many of us work for that? Yeah. How many of us work for the things of the world that are going to stay in the world? How many of us work to acquire power, possessions, wealth, prestige, honor, like all these things, play, like the things that are fleeting that stop once they put you six feet under. Yeah. And so if I can just have that perspective of, no, I'm going to pour into those things that I can take with me into eternal life, what a richer life you're going to live because now you're surrounding yourself with people. Right, you're surrounding yourself with experiences. You're surrounding yourself by others who are going to pour into you. Yeah, I think you know what you're saying. A lot of is is especially in marriage and with kids is that love is synonymous with sacrifice. So, what are you willing to sacrifice? And for me, it's like I have to die to myself. I have to die to what I want, and I have to die for what's best for my wife and for yeah. my kids in that order wife, then kids. And if we get that upside down, we can definitely put rifts between our marriage. We have to put in to our marriages so that our kids see that and then they get the benefit of it. And if the kids come above your your relationship with your with your spouse, you're setting yourself up. It's just like you're creating a wedge there. So like your, your marriage has to be first, then your kids come second. But I heard a good talk where, you know, it was about like, you know, I know my wife, no, a lot of people don't like doing dishes, right? I know, I've always had done the dishes like as a kid, that was like my job. So like, I don't mind doing the dishes. I tend to do the dishes like most of the time I'm doing the dishes. But it's not just because I'm gonna do them, but I'm doing them so that my wife will not have to do them. She's already busy and has a bunch of things going on. I'm usually the first one home. By the time she gets home, I usually make dinner and then I do the dishes so she can get caught up on the stuff that she needs to do. But the way that we should look at it is not, oh man, look at me, poor me. I gotta do the dishes every night. And I gotta do this and do this. Instead of looking at it, no, that's my altar. That's where I make sacrifices for my wife and mm -hmm. for my family. It's a little thing, but if we look at it as that is what I'm doing, that's what we're called to do is to make sacrifices. You can look at it as that, that's like an altar in your house. Like that's where I'm going to die to myself so that my wife doesn't have to do that. And it's a stupid example, but, no, but it, that's but, a beautiful image. But, it, but it's an image of it, you know? And that goes for a lot of other things in your life. Like, hey, or I'm gonna sacrifice that comment that I wanna say because I'm a smart Alex sometimes. 
instead of like doing that, I'll bite my tongue and, and trying to, you know, you know, Katie and I are both kind of alphas, you know? So it's like, you know, we, we like to get the last word in. So am I going to be the one this time that's not going to have to say the last word? Yeah. You know, am I going to sacrifice my ego basically, you know, for the sake of the other? So like that's She's where- known the two of you, those conversations must go forever. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. And, and that's fine because it's, you know, I was, what was that? I'm reading his book. I'm reading We Who Wrestle With God. And Jordan Peterson was talking a lot about like when God g gave- you know, our helpmate, Eve, is our helpmate, is that word is uh, eber kenegno, which literally means, can be translated, beneficial adversary, somebody to contend with, somebody who's going to help push me back on the things that need to be pushed back and to encourage me in the things that are. So yeah. we're there to sacrifice for each other, but also to help guide each other to be that person to run with, especially within your marriage, that's going to help us get to heaven. And that she's not going to say, oh yeah, you can do that. It's a sin. That's okay. No, like, hey, probably shouldn't say that. You probably shouldn't do that. Or, you know, calling you out, not in a way that's nagging and coming down and condescending, but building up and in supporting to try to help you create and make better decisions. Mm -hmm. That that's where the relationship should be. That that kind of relationship where you're willing to sacrifice and you're willing to die for that person and you're willing to help, help them get to heaven. That's basically what it's about. It's it's a beautiful image when we look at, the, I think the, Cro the Croatians have this beautiful image in a marriage at the altar that they hold the crucifix and they, they say, this is a symbol of our marriage. I'm, you're my cross. Like literally I'm going to die for you. Like in Ephesians says that, you know, the same way that Christ died for his church. And then they take that cross and then they put it up at their house. So every time they look at it, it's a reminder to us that Jesus died for us, that we're called to die to each other the way that he died for us. And how much in marriage do we talk about that anymore? It's like, no, I fell out of love and it ain't the same anymore. And the passion's not there. It's like, well, are you sacrificing? What are you putting into it and what kind of sacrifices are you making for the family for the whole for your love like are you not going to go out with the boys one night instead sitting in and watch hallmark movies yeah. with your wife you know which i can probably do better at doing that i just can't stand hallmark movies <laughs> but my wife loves them especially this time of year all the cheesy christmas movies i'm like no thanks but you know but one night compromising you know or sacrificing what i want to do for what she wants to do what yeah. she'd like to do team and i did that uh Crucifix at our at our wedding. Did you? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. But ours was blessed by the Pope, so uh, oh, a little you know, Catholic hey. flex there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> of course it was. Which Pope? Benedict? It's so true. Francis. Oh, Francis? Nice. <laughs> that's so, right? I don't know. That tone in my voice was wrong. Yeah. But yeah, well, that was Pope Francis. I mean, we have our favorites. If it was St. Yeah. John Paul II, I would be like, all right, cool. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's going to take me down to do another tangent on the Popes. So do you have that? Crucifix. Favorite Pope? No, the crucifix in your house, like hanging oh, yeah, on the wall. Oh, it's in our bedroom. It's in your bedroom, so yeah, yeah. it'll be reminded of. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it could be a, a site for prayer to come together and to, to but let's just be honest, that's, this goes back to that practicing. We have to practice those things. And if we mess up, it's not too late. Then we have to we'd start over again. We have to put in those practices of sacrificing sometimes. Like we get busy. It's like this I time love of the year. line, the world permits everything, forgives nothing. Yeah. Right? And yet the church gives us rules and forgives everything. Yeah, it's the opposite of what the world is. Mm -hmm. The world wants to cancel and Jesus wants to forgive. You know, it, it's a it's a big juxtaposition of what's going on. And I think that's what a lot of what we have to do and what we talked about in our group with this gratitude was, is shifting our mindset. A lot of the times, it's just a little tweak of like this, like this is what they're saying, but no, this is really it's switching. Hey, you know what? I don't have to do that. I don't have to do the dishes. I get to do the dishes. Just by changing how we say things and how we view it really changes the impact and the intentionality of turning that into a prayer versus, oh, I got to drudge through this thing. And it's just something simple. Like that's how saints are made. A saint is somebody who's able to take the things of everyday world and turn it into a prayer with gratitude for whatever that is. That's what a saint is. Mm -hmm. A saint is somebody that can consecrate every moment of the day. That takes the mundane, that can takes the holy, that can takes that and have intentionality to it and turn it into a prayer. And we are all capable and able to do that, to sacrifice and make those prayers and turn this podcast into a prayer offering up to God for somebody to me doing the dishes That's or so doing like, your job you know we when this comes out we will have celebrated thanksgiving and it's the holidays we're going into christmas it can be a very difficult time i'm thinking of a few people and i'm sure you know a few and it's it's a very common experience those who have lost a loved one you know and it's their first holiday without them it's a very difficult time um and sometimes i mean we have to go through difficult times god lets us go through difficult times. 
but it's in going through those difficult times that we get to experience, right? If God's like a diamond, there's many facets to him. We get to experience a new facet of him, of his love for us, of the grace that he has available to us and the kind of relationship he wants with us and what he wants for us. Um, it could easy be easy for us. Like when things are going great, things are going great. You really don't, you're not, you know, you're not retro, you, you, introspective. You're not reflecting on your situation. You're just enjoying the moment and you're, that's, that's really it. But those times are fleeting. I find that most of the, and let me know what your experience is like. I find most of the time when I'm going through hard things, that's when you have to be intentional. That's when you have to be purposeful. When you're going through hard things, that's when I've got to stop and reflect on who it is that I am, what situation that I'm in and who do I want to be? How do I want to respond? And that can be like the everyday stuff. It doesn't have to take, you know, the, the losing of a loved one going through the holidays. Yeah. It could just be like, man, I'm getting home and I'm like <laughs> exhausted. I'm not sleeping well. And I've got the kids like just all over me. Like those are, and when it's happening every day, every, I mean, it's what I'm living through now. It's like, it can wear on you. But how am I going to approach that situation? Like yeah. through what lens am I going to see it? And so, yeah, it takes a lot of work and it's easier said than done. But if you can, in small ways or in large ways, always pour yourself out for other people, and we're talking about marriage, that's one way to do that. Parenting's another way to do that. But if you're constantly pouring yourself out for other people, then you find like this renewed strength that you didn't have before. Like you're able to shift into a new gear that you didn't know you had. And you hear that from like Marines, you hear that from guys who are going through boot camp, basic training. You hear that, just going to the gym. It's like, I'm tired. I'm going to go work out. That doesn't make any sense. And yet you leave more energized than when you walked in. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, and just because we're doing purposely Catholic, hey, we're all human. Like, we all have our weaknesses. I mean, there's some Sundays, I'll be honest. There are few. But like, dude, the last thing I want to do is wake up and go to church right now. I'm just tired. I want to sleep. Monday, I got to start this whole grind over again. Work, kids, school, preparing lunches. It's like, I just want to sleep in. You got to do the thing, yeah. right? Because I value what it is that I'm doing. I might not feel it. You get up, you get dressed, you get the kids packed up in the car and you get to church. And just by doing that, like getting in and being engaged, like being intentional, mustering up the strength so that I'm present at mass best that I can be. I want to say nine times out of 10, you walk out a different person. You walk out again with this like renewed sense of self. Well, especially if you're honest, mm -hmm. you know, you but take you that thing. to do the thing. Yeah. I think that's the big thing. You got to do the right thing. You got to put in the reps, yeah. you know, you got to build those habits. So when the times are tough, you can't just start doing it when it's tough. You have already have to be doing it. Yeah. It's really hard when makes it's it tough. Easier. Yeah. It makes it way easier. But if you already built in that routine and those habits, like we're all creatures of habit. So like what habits are we making? Are you, are you waking up first thing you do before your bed, uh, your feet hit the ground saying, Lord, thank you for a new day. It could be as easy as thank you. Thank you for a new day. You know, try the morning offering. You know, I offer you all that this day may bring, the joys, the suffering, the love, my work, all these things, just offering up, just a prayer from your heart about an offering of the day. Are you doing that you every day? You know the first day? thing I do every morning? Go to the bathroom? Every morning. Before I go to the bathroom. Okay. But you got to take care of, you know, you got to take care of the body before you can care for the soul. Um, first thing I do, and it sounds silly, but I ask Jesus for a hug. Like when I'm in bed, <laughs> legit. I ask Jesus for a hug every morning, first thing I wake up, and I just I love it. Like I don't necessarily feel everything, uh, feel anything every time, but I always ask him for a hug, and it for me like it keeps that childlike relationship yeah. with him because it's so easy to like get caught up in okay you're a husband and a father and a dad and you be all these things and we put on all these masks in this world. I'm his child before I'm anything. My kids are his kids before anything. I walk out of their room every night that I, you know, we do our night prayers. And as I'm walking out, they have a crucifix next to the door. I give the crucifix a, crucifix a kiss and I say, Lord, watch over your children. Right? It's like, we can't forget that. And so that just, your, your, your expression of like 
what do you do when you wake up in the morning? I do that every morning, and I love yeah. it. It's like it's a simple thing. Yeah. It doesn't have to be complicated. You have to memorize it could, prayers. It could be, any, it could be you know, anything, it's like, as long as it's something. Exactly. And then putting in those reps. Mm -hmm. Like it takes reps. It takes practice. It takes, even if you don't feel it, if you get in that habit of doing it, you know, Monday through Friday, and then when tragedy hits, because it will hit, there will be suffering, there will be loss, there will yeah. be job insecurity, all those different things. So when it is tough, you already have that built-in habit of doing it. You fall back on a good foundation. And that's what the church is calling us to do. Yeah. You know, in this liturgical season, it's like, give gratitude always. Give thanks always. The mass is the ultimate form of that thanksgiving. They give thanks in all things. And it's a practice, but like, there's going to be those days you're not going to feel it. Like, you don't feel the hug. You know, even when you, you hug your spouse, it's like, oh, it's a half hug, you know, it's like, no, I want, we want always, but sometimes those masses where we go in with, with trepidation or we don't feel like it, or you may be a little hung over or whatever it may be that some of those are the best masses that you do get filled up is if you're open about it, like, God, I'm here. I really don't feel like being here, God. I need your grace. I need your help, you know, or just not at all, just going through the motions, but you're going not for what you can get out of it, but what you're offering up or what, you know, you're going for the right reasons. You're going not for how you feel, but for God. It's supposed to be worship for him. So yeah. it's like, but that kind of can lead us into. <clears throat> you mentioned to, liturgical seasons. Yes. That can lead us into this is that for me, I just kept thinking about the start of Advent of how much the season is meant to be self-emptying, of emptying of ourselves out to have space for Jesus Well, you to asked come me the in. question, why purple? Yeah, why purple? So why purple for Advent? So maybe just a little little uh, church theology geeking out for a second. Um, Advent is the, it signals the end of the liturgical year, right? The, the, the church, and when I say church, the community of disciples, we have a, a, a year that we follow just like you have in, in the secular world. You know, you got your new year and you got, you know, different holidays depending on the country and nationality that you're in, right? You keep a calendar. Well, the church being a collection of people, we have a calendar and our calendar has a start and it has an end and it's got, you know, holy days or holidays that we celebrate. And so the start of Advent signals the end of one year and the beginning of another year. And when this goes out, we'll be celebrating the first Sunday of Advent. Um, so we're entering this new year. Okay, great. Now, why purple? Why do we start the year with, with purple? And it's, it's a different purple than Lent, right? Again, we're still one's continuing more the geeking out. Royal, one's more blue. This one's like darker, blue. one's lighter. Yeah. Um, they're both supposed to signal preparation, right? That's a big uh, feature of Advent. We're, we're preparing, we're anticipating, we're waiting for the coming of Jesus. And so that's why the purple. Um, the Lent in purple is darker because it's, it's a preparation and penance. Like there's a specific penitential character to, to Lent because you're working towards, and it's a work, Lent is a work, you're working towards Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and then eventually Easter Sunday, yeah, Easter Sunday, uh, the Holy Vigil um, on Holy Saturday. But, so that's why purple. Yeah, and it's a, you know. So we start it, our year a, with It's a royal, it's a royal. Yeah. In, in the old times, too, purple was the most expensive color. It was like they had to take Moloch's and smash them and get this dye out of them. It was like a very rare thing. I remember the story with with Lazarus and the rich man was stepping over him and like the, they noticed he was wearing, even his underwear was purple, basically. It's like, that's how so rich he was. He, yeah, that's how rich he was. The purple was his royal, was royal yeah. this royal, you know. But I guess what I don't, I understood, yeah, like the, the Advent purple is a little bit more bluish tint for Mary because Mary's a big part in this whole. I never heard that before. Yeah, this is like a darker, it's like more of a bluish tint. I think it was Father Chris Alar was talking about it. But, you know, Advent, it was Saint, uh, I believe it was Saint Bernard of Clairvaux that, brought forth this idea of the three comings. Advent means coming or the preparation. Those three comings would be Jesus, you know, as the God-man coming in, in in the crib at the manger at, at Christmas Day, being born in physical body, taking on human flesh, the God-man being born. The second coming would be within our hearts and, you know, us letting him in, whether it's in the sacraments or scripture or or what it may be in prayer. And then the last coming would be the the second coming, you know, and that's what a lot of these readings, including this Sunday's reading, it's a lot of 
second coming. Be ready. Be prepared. Be watchful. Be on the guard. You don't know when God's coming. Don't be, don't be drowsy. Don't be, you know, drunk. Don't be, you know, lackadaisical. Be ready for the coming because no one knows when he's going to become. So always be prepared in this holy anticipation, this joyful hope that we're to hold on to. So it's a threefold coming. And we were talking a little bit last night, kind of throw it in. It's like, how do we how do we rectify that tension between that God has already come, but he's not yet come? That, you know, he loves us the way we are, but he loves us so much he doesn't want to keep us there. Like that tension between he's already conquered this world, but he's still yet to come, you know? So what are some some ways how to, to try to explain that to somebody? It's like, but he already came. What do you mean he's going to come again? Like, I don't understand this, this juxtaposition. Yeah, the way I like looking at it is, so for me, it's the season of Advent and the season of Lent, but specifically the season of Advent because it's the culmination that we're working towards. Advent has two defining characteristics. It's got a commemorative characteristic and it's got a preparatory, anticipatory characteristic. So in Advent, we commemorate and we prepare. We commemorate the first coming of Jesus, right? The actual... Uh, the processions of the Magi, the, the the journey of Joseph and Mary, the, uh, the 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 anticipation that was felt by all the holy men and women who were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Um, so there's this commemorative. We're looking back and we're honoring the first coming of Jesus. Great. It's also preparatory because we're also anticipating that Jesus is coming again. It's looking forward to his second coming. Um, and that, that that kind of characteristic is highlighted by the church in the beginning of our new year because the church wants to remind us that Jesus is coming again. And so everything we're going to do for the rest of this year is in light of Jesus is coming again. And so there's this like thread that weaves the whole year. And it's this thread of holy anticipation. Everything we're doing is this constant conversion, constant turning from the world from our inward gaze toward Christ, right? Looking ahead, right? Seeing seeing the coming of our Lord, seeing him in other people, seeing him in our sacrifices and our dying, dying to ourself. So commemoration, preparation. And so to your question, Bobby, it's like, for me, the season of Advent, this like juxtaposition, this tension, I know Jesus is coming again. I know he's coming again. No one knows when he's coming again. But here's what I do know. I'm going to go to him. And if if probability has any, any sway in this, it's more likely that I'm going to him before he comes to me, right? Yeah. And the, 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 the statistics on that is 100% I'm going to him, right? I, I once heard, and I've shared on the podcast, one of my conversion moments back into the faith, reversion moments, was... Uh, an evangelical pastor who was saying, like, if, you're, if your life's a book and you flip forward a couple pages in that book, you flip forward a couple chapters in that book, no matter how many years you're blessed with, there is a date that's going to be circled in red. And on that date, you're going to stand before your maker. You're going to stand before God. Whether you believe in him or not, like, that's just the reality that we're in and we're a part of and there's it's objective. And so Advent is like this season of preparing to meet Jesus. And so Father Mike Schmidt, he had, uh, and it's a great, if you want to look it up, YouTube video on the meaning of Christmas or the meaning of Advent or, or one of the two. He's, and a, he draws on Catholic tradition in, in saying this, right? Memento mori, this idea of remembering your death. Like who thinks about remembering their death in Advent? Who thinks about remembering their death in Christmas? We're so busy, you know, decorating and preparing and holidays and feasting. That's not what it's about. That's what it's become. That's what it could be. Like, I do that. I geek out on that stuff. And we can talk about why we do that stuff. But at its core, it's preparing to meet Jesus. And he challenges people, like, think of December 25th as the day you're going to die. Yeah. That's this new challenge they're doing this year. Yeah. Oh, are they? Ascension. Yeah, they're doing a... How powerful is that? Yeah, if you died on Christmas, yeah. If how how much different would Advent look? Yeah, how would you prepare? And that's what Advent is calling us to. It's calling us to prepare. So it's like, imagine December 25th, you knew you were going to die. You knew, right, this whole idea of like, Jesus is going to be born. Jesus is here. The Savior is here. Yay, we're going to exchange gifts. We're going to celebrate Christmas. We're going to do all this fun stuff. But 
see it for what it is. Like, imagine you were going to Jesus. Yeah, and that leads me to 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 how I've come to understand how the, to reconcile that tension is going to Jesus because the word Advent is translated from the Greek word, which is parousia, which we hear parousia, we always think that's the second coming of Christ. So it's that the first coming and then the last, the third one would be the second coming, but it's that in between time of coming, Jesus coming into our hearts. But a better translation of parousia than second coming is presence. And we know the true presence of Jesus Christ is fully in his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. So that tension in between is in between. He's already come. He's yet to come. But the present, that he left us that gift of his parousia, his presence fully in the Eucharist to hold us and sustain us in that time of of uh, anticipate, you know, this uh, this hope that we're holding on to. And if we hold on to that hope, he's going to feed us so that we don't feel like he's so far away. No one knows. It could be, you know, 10,000 years from now, but he's already came. And I missed it. You know, I'm never going to be there. I, so the way that he, he's here now, the, he, he's here now in a, in a full parousia that we get to see him face to face. If we go to adoration or anytime that we receive him or anytime we're where two or three are gathered, there he is, that we can literally enter into that, that he's outside space and time, that he loves us and he wants to come into that space and let us feel his presence. And there's those times where obviously we don't feel the presence and that's okay, but we still put ourselves there. We still show up to mass. We still receive him in, in a state of grace. We still are preparing because what he's trying to do is that's what hope is. It's to stretch us, to make us ready to love him fully in heaven. Like we're not ready yet. So this is getting us to long for things. That's like anything, like the longer we have to wait sometimes and we have to, we stretch, we long for it. We want it more as like, okay, I got this vacation in a year from now. And you're thinking about it and you're hoping and you're thinking. It's the same with meeting Jesus again. It's like, are we going to be prepared for when we die. We don't know when it's going to be. Are we going to be preparing? Are we stretching? Are we longing for him? Are we going to put in the time and put in those reps to be ready for that moment? And Christmas is a good time to do that. It's like, we need to be ready for him at Christmas because mm -hmm. we never, we may die. We may die at Christmas Eve. We may die who knows when, but we should always be ready in that time. I like uh, on that point, uh, Patrick, but David and, you know, value attainment, they've got, yeah. they put out a shirt a while back called Future Looks Bright. Oh, okay. It's like a whole marketing. Gotta wear shades. My future looks bright. I gotta wear shades. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Should have brought them out. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Patrick Bet David and Value Tainment, they put out this shirt, Future Looks Bright. And when I first heard, I'm like, what is this guy talking about? Future Looks Bright. And this is like in the middle of the, middle of the political campaign. And and my marketing like side of my brain was like, that's too many syllables for a slogan. That's never going to catch on. But my Catholic side is like, yeah, of course the future looks bright. Not because I hope in any one political party, not, in a, not that I hope in one administration, not that I place my hope in one political figure, not that I hope for the betterment of the economy or whatever it is. No, the future looks bright because Jesus is present here and in tomorrow, right? He's yeah. ever present, ever new. He's past, present, and future. He's the alpha and the omega. And yeah, the future does look bright. And so even for us as Christians, as Catholics, we, we have to have this burning within us that the future does look bright and that no matter what I'm in right now, if I'm working toward living virtuously, if I'm working toward being an upstanding citizen, if I'm working toward being the best version of myself, if I'm working toward being a disciple of Christ, yeah, my future looks bright and I can bring as many people as I can into that reality, right? They don't have to be lost to the world and to the one who rules this world. No, because he wants, he wants darkness. He wants to shroud the world in darkness. And yet Christ comes to be light and in that, yeah, future looks bright. Yeah. And there's no accident that when Jesus comes at Christmas, it's like the darkest time of the year. He is the light of the world that mm -hmm. that, that brings that brings the, the joy, that brings this hope in, in, into our hearts. And I think we an, another good way to understand it is, you know, Father Ricardo in his I rescue love project. Father he, Ricardo stuff. Yeah. Well, he talks if, about if it like World, this, World War II. Yeah. You cool. have to listen to <clears throat> Father Ricardo stuff. He's got a newsletter. He puts out it's excellent acts29.org yeah um, and he's got a he's got a, an advent rescue yeah, rescue we, project rescue he does story rescue for advent but he has a, a series so we're big on alpha here but he was big on alpha is big on alpha he did something called rescue project so we're doing it here at our church definitely get involved once we roll it out parish wide right now we're doing it with some of our connect groups yeah we we're went through it excellent definitely go yeah go through it so go ahead yeah Bobby. but his, yeah his analogy is which it works out well is that you know world war 2 is that the battle 
like the people who were in occupied France in, in those countries, when the Allies landed at D-Day in June 6, 1944, they 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 knew hope was there that the the, the Americans were their savior, you know. But the war it was still, just a matter of time. It was just a matter, a of, matter time. of time. Yeah. It was that mop up operation where they still had to march to Berlin. They still had to go through the battle. The ball they had yeah. to go through all these battles. But once they invaded uh, Normandy, like that was the invasion, and that's kind of like the way it is. Like yes, he came, but there's still a lot of you know. That battle was won. He he defeated death and sin, but there still has the evil one it has a, a mob up operation. And Father John Ricardo does a great job of doing that. Maybe we could try to get him on one of these uh, these purposely, and he can explain it because I think you know it's one thing like Catholics are good at putting out a lot of good material, but we need to help all the different creators who try to help each other get, especially when someone does something good to get it out there to oh, other sure. people and to share it because, you know, there's a, there's a difference of marketing and getting it out there versus somebody who can create great content, but trying to help other people. Oh yeah, PBD's going to gonna sell a bunch of those Future Looks right here. Yeah, and, and just after this plug here. So it's yeah, like, I want to cut it. Yeah, we want to cut, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it, it's one of those things where you know, we need to be ready for Advent. Yeah. And, you know, the best way that we can do that, I just always, I'm, I'm really like convicted by the story of, you know, Mary and, and Joseph showing up at the end and them saying, there's no room here. And I just look and think about that as myself. Like if Jesus and Mary showed up, would I have room for them? If I didn't really know, hey, this is the Messiah, you know, but like, would I like help a stranger? Would I have that room for for somebody else in my life? Would I take that time to stop and say, you know, I'll help you, this stranger, this person? Because Jesus tells us how you took care of the strangers, how you took care of me. And would yeah. I be willing to stop what I'm doing like tomorrow and go help deliver meals? Or will I do those things for the other person? Because when you do that, you're literally doing that for Jesus. And I mean, obviously there's, you know, a direct correlation, like am I... Have, do I have room for Jesus this holiday season? Or is it about my shopping list and Black Friday and all these different things? Or am I making time for him to 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 go deeper into scripture, to pray, to spend more time with him, to serve and to do those things? Am I emptying out myself so that he can fill me so when you Christmas comes? You could even comes, make, and this is, I love that, you know, we're talking about the major thing because I, I wanted to bring it up as well. This, you know, the idea that Joseph and Mary went throughout the town trying to find a place for themselves. No room in the inn. Like the, nobody had space for them. Imagine, like imagine you were that person that turned away Joseph and Mary, pregnant with with the Savior, pregnant with Jesus, and you turned them away because there's no space. So A, is there room in our hearts for them to find a home? And in order to make room, you got to clear some stuff up. In order to make room, you got to pour yourself out or you got to empty you got to give generously, like you you listed a couple different ways to do. Um, and then one of the things that I like is like, I don't, I, I love the Christmas season, like Advent and into Christmas. I love the decorating of the house. Like I love the, and having my kids be a part of that. I, I love seeing the town just like decorated and and Especially it's, Saint John with all the mangers, all of oh, like yeah, fifty mangers. Oh, my mother in law loved it. Like when she first came here, she's like, "Oh yeah, I want to live here." <laughs> Every intersection, there's a manger scene. But I love seeing that stuff. Why? It's like you're, you're decorating the house that that house that Jesus was rejected from, right? That's not this house. No, this house is prepared for you. This house is ready to celebrate you. We trim the tree. We put up lights. We 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 have fun. We can do the things of the culture. If it's in right perspective, right? If, if it's done correctly and you do that, not because I want my house to look cool and I want the, you know, I, I want to be the coolest house on the block. I want to be the cool dad. I want to be, I want to have all the tricks and the, the lights and all that. No, it's like, no, I want to do it because I'm preparing my house. We're celebrating the fact that Jesus is coming. We're celebrating the fact that he's coming into this home. And like, we want to commemorate that. I mean, I celebrate birthdays for my kids and it's like, you go all out for your kid's birthday. Heck, he's one. He doesn't remember what we're doing. And yet you got balloons and streamers and all this stuff because you love your kid, right? You want to celebrate your kid. You invite other people that like, the kid's not going to remember that they were here. But it's just the joy of the occasion. And so like, that's what those things can be. And so, yeah, you can still do the things of the culture. You can still do the things that, you know, but put them in the right context, yeah. give them meaning. And that, it's not that I'm assigning meaning to it. It's like, start seeing it through God's eyes. 
Yeah, and I think all, in all those things of the world, they don't really realize how much it's just really hijacked from Catholic tradition. Yeah, from exactly. hanging up the stockings where that's the story the of St. Nicholas. The Santa Claus and the, the buying Santa of the Claus, gifts and all that stuff. Or putting up lights as yeah. Jesus is the light. Or, you know, so there are some things that we can do. Uh, I know a good thing that we, we've done in the past thinking about the manger is that, you know, every thing that you do for somebody else, you write it down and you put it to become like the straw for Jesus. Like we're preparing, not just with our prayers, but our deeds and our actions to prepare doing good for other people in this time, especially when there's so many people, you know, our parish does a great job. We got the angel tree and we got, you know, yeah. bags of giving, but buying gifts for other people, just turning away from what am I going to get? And instead of like, what are we going to give? But you know, that's good for the kids. Like, Hey, you know, encouraging them. Hey, Hey, did you do something nice for somebody today? Okay. Write it down. Like having that goal of the day, like to do one good deed a day. We, we did. Um, and we're, I guess both of you, both of us we're, we're just sharing kind of like, hopefully somebody hears something. Yeah. I want to do that with my family. This isn't yeah. boastful. Yeah. Right? It's just ideas it's like that, ideas we heard, that we're, that we're, we're doing and we're sharing. Else, yeah. and, and I heard a couple ideas last night that I want to start doing with my family. But like one of the things that we're doing with with Jacob, and he's old enough now to like to understand what's going on, like he's got a piggy bank and he saves and everything goes in the piggy bank. Well, we we're doing Angel Tree, which a lot of churches do Angel Tree, right? This idea of like you can buy stuff for for someone in need or a cause that's in need or what have you. And so he picked out his Angel Tree card and it was for a, a little boy. They don't give you their name, but he's he's a year old. And there's a list of things that the little boy needs. And it's like he picked out that card, so he's he's gonna own it. And like he had that card that whole Sunday, and it's like he it was almost like a treasure to him. Like this is, I picked out this card. This is my card. And it's like okay, good, that's great. Step one. So we're gonna take that piggy bank. We're gonna open it up, and then we're gonna go cash it in, and it's gonna go in thirds. A third is gonna go towards buying the stuff off this list. He's gonna actually contribute to to giving back, and the third's gonna go. <coughs> Back into savings, and then the third is going to be for him to buy whatever he wants to buy. So, like, you can make Christmas using opportunity, like everyday opportunities like that. This idea of buying gifts—it's not so much like the gift. Don't get hyper focused about the gift or the amount of the gift, or it's this idea of like giving generously. That the is what sacrifice matters. too. Yeah, it's a sacrifice. Yeah, if you just do it for them, it's not going to see. You know, our kids are the same thing. They pick somebody that's close to their age. They like they were looking through like what they want. Like it was a girl, mm -hmm. you know, Avery's age, Braden's age. Yeah, and then they're then it, it's part of like hey. It, it's it's not just about the gifts. It's not just about receiving. It's about giving and how we can help other people. And I think that you know, there's tons of ideas. Like whatever, go on. You know, Pinterest or going these things. There's tons of things that you can do to incorporate things that are not. You know, that are Catholic that you can make this Advent season less about just you know Black Friday deals and, and Christmas movies and and those kinds of things, which. Which are fine. Yeah, I scored a couple of great Black Friday deals. Did you? Yeah, I know. I got. Yeah, I got uh, a remote starter for the car. I got. Uh, I got. Our, we got our. Uh, we do this. Dude, we, we live in the snow. I need a remote starter. Bro. Yeah, we do this uh, thing the for our kids. The car's dead. So, <laughs> yeah, right. We do this thing with the kids. We've been doing it since they were born, which is uh, something they want, something they need, something to wear, something to read. Yeah. So those are like we're not going yeah, overboard. We do that too. It's like so, like you know, and then you know. You know, they get tons of gifts from all the other people, but from us, it's like, no, it's more about Jesus. It's like, you know, you're not, I don't have to spend a uh, thousand yeah, dollars. On clothes you. and then some sort of toy or something that yeah. we know they didn't yeah, And something, you know, and then they can pick something they, they want or whatever, you know. But I think that what the biggest lessons that we could teach them are the things of being Catholic, like lighting the Advent candle, going through, you know, leading them in, in, in prayer on Sunday, making it a big deal, making Sunday... Advent wreath, like a big deal, you know, like we usually do like a, every Sunday we do like a roast or we do like a big meal together and we sit at the fancy dining room table. Like usually we sit in the kitchen. It's like, you know, just a normal meal. But on Sundays we try to go to the, you know, bust out the nicer dishes and make it something memorable. Like no Sunday dinner is different. And during Lent, like this is even bigger, like elevate it some, like, Hey, you know, let's, let's take this serious and, and to get them involved in like, you know, having them do the readings or have them offer up different uh, ideas, get them involved because kids have good ideas too. Like, well, what, can we do this or could we do yeah. that? You know, this season could, could be whatever you put into it, you know, whatever you make of it is what you're going to get out of it and being intentional. All I know is when Christmas rolls around, I look forward to two things. And one of them is Mike Jakubilski's annual gift. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. What's it called, Mike? It's called uh, Yez. J-E-Z. 
That's all it is, J E Z. Yeah. This stuff. Have you had this stuff before? Yeah. You got to tell them what it is, Mike. So it's basically, dude, it's Everclear, but we we <laughs> doctor it up. It's doctored up Everclear. It's kind of like a. Uh, we call it like Christmas hooch or whatever yeah. you want to call it. And the process. But you guys is, have like a whole tradition around it. Yeah, we do. We make a full day out of it. We cook all of the uh, yej, and it's just uh, flavored Everclear with uh, sugar, honey. Cinnamon, um, clove, and uh, we light it on fire because that's a tradition. Somebody says that it, it like chemically alters the flavor somehow. I don't know if that's all BS or it's real, but we do it every year. And yeah, it's that's uh, cool. Th those traditions are important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like regardless of what that is, like you can make your own family traditions. Like we have, you know, our little family traditions that we do that are, I know, yes, yeah, from like the Polish black. Uh, Polish blackberry brandy. They call it Yezhi. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's mm -hmm. probably somewhat, yeah, so kind of related. Yeah. Think, yeah. So, yeah. No, it's, but, you know, I guess what we're trying to say is don't let the busyness, like no, the reading no. say in Luke says, don't be drowsy. Don't be lackadaisical. Don't get caught up in just the, 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 the parties and the drinking and the overeating and all those things. But to, to, to remember the reason for the season, Jesus Christ himself. So anything We're else? We're going to talk more about Advent. We got... As we go, yeah. Yeah, Advent's four weeks. So eventually the purple will get... Uh, the third week, it'll be rose, not mm -hmm. pink. It'll be rose. And we'll, we'll be ready for sure. Yeah. And maybe some... Eventually we'll get some yezh. That'd be... What I can't... <laughs> and we'll talk about this like on the Christmas episode. But next episode, not this one, next one will be 52 episodes. Yeah. And so let's say a year of episodes... Um, so I'm thinking back to when we first started. We started this about the same time last year. I got in hot water for some reason. Like it was the first time that like our channel just blew up for the first time. And it was around one of the videos was me talking about Christmas. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. And, and I was in Cal I forgot what it was about. Oh yeah. It was like Sol Invictus or something and and the pagan myths with Christmas. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. oh, yeah. And I then remember. I remember Bobby and I, like, there are tons of comments. Mm -hmm. So much hate. And I'm in California visiting Dima's family. <laughs> and, like, we're, we're trying to respond because, like, we want to respond. Like, this is a ministry here. Like, we want, people who want to engage, we want to engage with. Yeah. But it is also fun to, like, tease the trolls. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. I get too much enjoyment out of that. Yeah. And I think I was wearing a Santa and then hat. Bobby texted me like, as we're in the thick of it, he's like, "Yeah, we, we were like, um, welcome to the welcome to social media, or like, welcome to the internet." And I'm like, <laughs> "Okay, yeah." <laughs> well, that's where the people are at. So that's what why yeah, that's we're, we're do, that's people. why we're doing this. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're you know we don't know everything, and you know we'll, we'll say some things that maybe don't make sense sometimes, or we ramble on too much. But we're here trying to help. People who are like us, who are trying to grow in their faith, trying to be liturgical because we're living that way. We're trying to encourage other people to live liturgically so mm -hmm. that you're following along with what the church is doing. But we're trying to put out content that's, you know, different, conversational. Like I said, we don't, you know, have a script and we're here just trying to uh, be purposely Catholic. Amen. Amen. Oh, excuse me. Bless you. Well, how funny was uh, my friend that uh, that came to the to the thing last night? The he physicist? Said, no, my buddy who's, uh, no, Gary, he said, um, he's starting his own podcast. It's going to be called Purposely Protestant. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, he's the physicist. No, he's not. No, he, no. He, he, yeah, you were like one of the episodes. He came up to me. He's like, yeah, Bobby called me. Like, I'm doing physics. Like, I'm, Oh, yeah. No, yeah. He, he does like concrete <laughs> yeah, and does yeah. stuff. But he, he's a solid guy. Yeah, he's, he's funny. He's, he's starting funny. A, his own Purposely Protestant? Yeah, no. Will he have us on? Well, well good luck he, if he's listening. We're coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't know it yet. That's it. Right on. Well, anything else? That's it. I think I think we can build on this as the weeks go on. And then we try to also usually bring in news stories, but you know, not so much political. There's two everything right now is going on is just political. So we yeah. kind of just avoided uh focus on gratitude. Thanksgiving, post Thanksgiving, a little Black Friday, and then some Advent. St. John the Evangelist. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us. Amen. All right. Thanks for watching.